ready. We got the kids with us this morning, which means the game, the, the service is a little different. It's a little noisier. We got more jostling, more noise. That's all good. There is nursery available for the littles if they need a, a place to run around. Uh, we got people back there that are more than happy to take 200 of them. So, uh, so we're going to play a game to start off with, and it's a competition game with your neighbors, as we should always do right before Valentine's Day. So, uh, so this is the game. It is a Super Bowl game. Are you ready for it? Oh, t- if you're not ready, then I'm, we're going to skip it. Are you ready? All right. This is the Super Bowl, the history of the toilet games. All right. So, so what you're going to do is you're going to work against somebody and, and work together to plunge the depth of your toilet. Plunge the depth of your toilet. Not plunge the depth of your toilet knowledge. Let's see how much you know about the toilet. And this is competition against those around you. Ready? What well, you should do. I'm pretty sure the early church did stuff like this occasionally. They didn't have the other tricks. All right, question number one. How much toilet paper does the average person use a day? This is in place of a dumb dad joke, by the way. 17 sheets, 27 sheets, 57 sheets, 77. You got three seconds. Two, one. It is 57 sheets. 57. That's why Costco sells the mega pack. Mega pack. All right, next question. The word toilet is derived from the French word toilette, which means what? Tiny bowl, little cloth, smelly room, or tiny room? <laughs> you got five seconds to, to tell your neighbor. Don't tell me. Five, four, three, two. It means little cloth, little cloth. Those French, they're so romantic with their, with their. <laughs> That's the next one. On board a ship, the toilet is called what? The loo, the splash, the head, or the? WC, the water closet. You got the four, three, seven. It is the head. It is the head. All right. Um, well, how about this one? An old saying for going to the toilet was. <laughs> was it? <laughs> it's almost as funny as a, as a dad joke. Drop some things off, have some private time, release the group. <laughs> This is an old saying, Luke. It's not a modern saying. Or spend a penny, which is the correct term for an old saying for me. <laughs> it is spending a penny because it used to cost a penny to use the public loo. Oh, man, that's a good one. The World Toilet Organization was formed in 2001 to A, provide a union for porta potty workers, B, commemorate the history of the toilet, C, improve toilets in the developing world, or D, innovate new plumbing features. Which one? Three, two, one. It is to develop and improve toilets. That's actually a good cause, right? If you've used toilets in uh, developing countries, you would know they need a lot of improvement. In the early 20th century, many families used blank for toilet paper. I'm not going to read them. <laughs> early 20th century. Three, two, one. Newspaper. Newspaper. Yeah, yeah. November 19th is Hug a Plumber Day, Toilet Paper Anniversary, World Toilet Day, or Universal Flush Day. It's not Hug a Plumber Day. There's no such day. It is... World Toilet Day, and I hope you celebrate that right before Thanksgiving. No comments. There's so many things that could be said. Tiebreaker, last one. I don't know who's winning in your row, but this is the last question. In the 1600s, people used chamber pots or cesspits, which were cleaned by men called what? Unemployed? (laughs) Gong farmer, sanitation specialist, or blue fetters? It is gong farmers. Gong farmers. All right, Jessica said, you're not going to play that. In, you're not going to do that in church, are you? And I said, yeah, I'm going to do that in church. But I didn't know. I may have offended some of you, and I'm sorry if using toilet humor here, when I'm sure you hear it 24-7 elsewhere, was offensive to you. So just to change things up, since we talked about Super Bowl, let's talk about Valentine's Day, another quick co- game against your partner. No, it's not a game. It's, it's more of a challenge. So what you're going to do is there's going to be two different things. It's, it's which is the better date. So you're going to get two options. Which is the better date option? See, see if you agree or you disagree. You've got to defend your position. So the first one is hot air balloon ride versus a walk on the beach. Wow. And anybody say hot air balloon ride? 
Okay. How many of you are scared of heights and that would totally not be okay? How many of you are scared of sharks and you don't want to walk on the beach for those sand sharks? Right? Okay. That seemed like there was a lot of unison for the most part on that. All right, next one, a little more challenging. Which date would you prefer? All you can eat at McDonald's or a painting class? All you can eat at McDonald's. <laughs> all the young boys said, all you can eat McDonald's. No, I'm not gonna paint. All you can eat McDonald's or painting class. You got it? Yeah. All right, only the men answer. One, two, three. McDonald's. All right. Women answer one, two, three. Yeah, uh -huh. all right, all right. Uh, all right, next one, a picnic or trampoline play. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot of education for our young men before they start going on dates in order to win the hearts of their, of their prospective brides if they say trampoline park before, before a picnic. All right, all right, how about, how about these two? Horseback ride at sunset. Aw. Or a day on a yacht. Yeah? Are you learning something new about those around you? I hope so. We've got two more here. A couple more. So, so next one. Would you rather go on a road trip for a date or browse a bookstore with a coffee? <laughs> I heard, I heard at least one coffee. I know my wife made that. Let's go to the bookstore. Road trip is good too, though. All right, last one, and, and here we go. We, we kind of figure out personality types in a hurry here. Ready? Would you rather go skydiving or a fancy dinner? <laughs> yeah? Which one's cheaper? They're all free. If you're not ready for Valentine's Day before today, now you are. You got, you got 24 hours to make one of these happen, guys. All right, let's jump into the Bible. We're looking at Romans. Romans chapter 1 through 8 shows us the immense beauty and plan of God's work of salvation. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's majestic. It does it by giving us these big therefore moments, which we've talked about week after week after week. The first therefore moment is that God's wrath is revealed against the sinfulness of humanity. What that means is when we sin, God allows us to receive the consequences of that sin, even if that means we forget about God. He allows it. That's his wrath, is he allows us to receive the consequences of our sin. The second thing is God's righteousness is revealed. Although he allows us to receive the consequences, and when we receive consequences, it will lead us into destruction, God offers a lifeline of salvation. And that is his perfection, his righteousness, his holiness offered freely to anyone who would believe in what God has done for them through Jesus Christ. So when you say yes to what God has done for you through Jesus Christ, that yes, he took your sin. Yes, he died for it on the cross. Yes, he offers his perfection to you in place of your sin. Yes, you choose to follow him. When you do that, then you have that righteousness and you have peace with God and you have access to God. And it is a wonderful thing to have peace with God, access to God, not to have a wall between you, not to have barriers of, of uh, anger between you, but you have open relationship with God. And that means the last therefore is there's no condemnation left. If you say yes to Jesus and God forgives your sin, then there's nothing left to condemn you. There's nothing left to separate you from him. And that is good news. That's what we call the gospel, the good news. And so our past is what, church? Forgiven, and our present then is peace and access, that we have the Holy Spirit, and our future is the secure hope that only comes through Jesus Christ. We have hope not just that we be forgiven, we can have a relationship with him now, but that we can know him face to face for all eternity. And friends, there is nobody you want to know more than Jesus. So what we've learned through Romans is that following rules and laws don't make a person righteous. They can't make you righteous. The rules your parents laid out for you were to form your character, to kind of guide you on the right path, but they didn't make you right, did they? They made you maybe obedient, they made you mindful, and their punishment may have helped you stay in line, but it didn't fix your heart. No rules, no laws can fix a heart. They show us our need, that we need to have a broken heart, a hard heart towards God, and that we need his help. As it says in Ezekiel 36, 26, that we need him to remove our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh that knows him and that follows him and yearns for him. So we say when we say yes to Jesus, 
And I hope, friends, and I've said this over and over again, because I never know, maybe today is the day that you say yes to Jesus for the first time. And I, I don't want to miss that opportunity. If you haven't said yes to Jesus, let it be today. When you do say yes to Jesus, to what God has done for you, then you become adopted, his beloved son, his beloved daughter. You're welcomed into his family, into his home. You become a new person, a person that is more and more like Jesus. So we've seen that over and over again, and we began to see this over and over again. That's Romans 1 through 8, Romans 9 through 16, then show us what comes next. And as beautiful and wonderful as Romans 1 through 8 is, Romans 9 through 16 is just as captivating, if not more so. It's one thing for God to say, I forgive you, I love you, and, and you are now right and holy. It is another to see that he has tremendous plans for us. Plans that are not just for here and now, but plans that carry on into eternity. So 9 through 16 show us how then do we grow in this faith? How then do we become more and more like Jesus? How do we become holy? How do we walk into this righteousness? Because that is God's plan for you. It is good. It is glorious. He wants you to shine for him. He wants you to be light of the world, salt of the earth. He wants you to do these things, and he's going to show you how. And here we go. Romans 1 through 8, though, as we read it, it often feels like it applies in isolation. Like, it's just about me. My sin, get it taken care of. Now I'm forgiven. Now I have relationship with God. Now I'm not condemned. But that's not what the Bible's about. We find Romans 9 through 16 shows us that God's plan revolves always around this word. Say it with me. Community. community. Community is what we are here this morning. We are a community of believers gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. Right? Amen. All right. So that's what we're here for. So we talked about this last week, that there are then... Therefore, this understanding in Romans 12, the rest of the New Testament as well, show us that God's plan is to continue everything that Jesus was doing, the ministry, the work of Jesus, to continue that through the lives of believers. Now, if you said yes to Jesus, then hold your hand up. It's nothing to be ashamed. So said yes to Jesus, then that means God's plan is to continue what Jesus was doing through you, through us. So we saw this last week. We see there's these two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness, the prince of the air, as it says in Ephesians 6. All the principalities of this dark realm are at work to bring captivity to sin, to bring darkness into the lives, to bring all of that brokenness to separate people from God, to steal, kill, and destroy. And there is a kingdom of God. And when Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. I think it's the greatest prayer that we can pray is that his kingdom would come. Because his kingdom coming is not just that it would show up, but that it would go to war against the kingdom of darkness. It would do a lot of this. It's, it's just taking over, taking over the kingdom of darkness. How does that happen? We talked about last week how it involves all of us, every single believer on the planet. It involves the church. It involves these gifts. Today we are going to talk about something that is commonly misunderstood in, in Christian life, commonly not taken action on in life, and when we do not pay attention to this part of the Christian life, we miss out on so much of what God wants to do through us. So if you don't know this, you're not alone. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are the gifts that are given to believers by the Holy Spirit of God. These gifts then enable each believer to serve the mission of the church, continuing the ministry of Jesus. As we look at this today, rather than me just talk, we're going to be reading scripture, but you're also going to be hearing quotes from people that I asked throughout this week, people who I consider mature Christians who are sensitive to listening to the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to hear random quotes. I'm not going to name each person. I'm just going to let them be anonymous quotes. But people who, um, some of them are in your midst. Some of them are far away. Some of them are in ministry. Some of them are, are not in a public position, title, like pastor. But they're very much seeking to serve the Lord. So as we look at these things, we're going to see and hear from people just like you and just like me. So as we look at these spiritual gifts, we understand we're going to look at the three different sections that they're mainly mentioned in, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. And we're going to see that they have a common source, that they have a common purpose, but they have uncommon experience. 
The source of all the gifts is common. We're going to look at that in each of those sections. The purpose of each of those is common. We're going to see that as well. But the experience of what those look like in day-to-day -day life is different. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. I understand that this is maybe something that you don't know much about. And that's okay. I don't remember my church, when I got saved in high school, talking a lot about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I remember us talking some about what speaking in tongues is and whether or not that's okay. I remember hearing people preach. I remember being asked to speak. I remember being in the presence of people who were teaching. But I do not remember a lot of lessons on the spiritual gifts. And yet the Bible talks very clearly about it as a key part of the church. All right? Are you good? Yes. Ready? Ready for the first quote? I think you will like this one. I don't really know my spiritual gift. I think I used to, but I'm not sure now. I wanted to use that one first because this is somebody who's been in different ministry positions over the years, who's been an active part of church ministry. And yet when I asked this person, uh, just, just flat out asked them, they said, you know, and it wasn't a negative comment. It wasn't they were down on themselves. She just said, I don't really know what my spiritual gift is. I think I used to, but I'm not sure now. I wanted to use that one first just in case you're right there with that person. If you're, if you're there and you say, I don't, I don't know much about spiritual gifts, and I don't know if I have one, and I don't know what it is, you're not alone. This is why we're going to look at this. It's going to take some time to read all this out, so let's dig in and let's go for it. All right, ready? We're going to start in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 8. It says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Would you read verse 6 and on with me? We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. All right, so Romans 12 talks about spiritual gifts. We just read it last week some. We're looking at it a little closer today. What is the common source that we see in Romans 12? Where do spiritual gifts come from? Spiritual gifts are given by God's grace. How many of you had M&Ms in your hand when you walked into the sanctuary this morning? How many have M&Ms now? How many of you ate your M&Ms? <laughs> All right, good to know. How many of you ate your parents' M&Ms? <laughs> Spiritual gifts are given by God's grace. What does that mean? It, in his kindness, in God's kindness, in God's wisdom, he equips each of us to be effective for eternal purposes. In other words, God wants to use you to work through you to do things for his kingdom which impacts eternity. Not 10 days, not 10 years, not 100 years, but forever. That's what God wants to do in and through each and every one of you. All right? What about the common purpose of the spiritual gifts seen in Romans 12? The common purpose is there is one body, the body of Christ, but it has many functions. So there's one body, many functions. What do we understand from that? The meaning is, beliefs of the church are empowered in different ways for the overall purpose of the church. How many of your M&Ms were all the same color? If you got one, then it was all the same color. If you look closely, and some of you probably did, you may have gotten more M&Ms than the person next to you or less M&Ms than this next person. They might have got your favorite color you may have got their favorite color. You don't know. You didn't get a sign. They weren't assigned by you. They were given randomly here. But spiritual gifts, likewise, are given as one body, many different functions, empowered in different ways for the overall purpose of the church. And the overall purpose of the church is to do what? Continue the ministry of Jesus. This person said, I learned my gift through an intensive course in missionary training. Everyone, he said, has a primary gift, but they can still do other things. 
This, this man's gift was teaching, and, and I affirm that gift in him. I know him very well. Because I learned my gift through an intensive course of missionary training. He was going through this process of, of learning to be a missionary in China. And so it was a long process of not only learning language and, and culture, but also just intense making sure you're grounded. And in that process, one of those things is what are your primary spiritual gifts? And so as he worked in the community of other believers, that came to be the forefront of what it was that was his spiritual gift. And he has story after story after story to tell how God used him in many different situations, many in times of crisis in China, in order to bring about stability and the good news of Jesus to people who didn't know him. I would like you to do something for me. Take your bag of M&Ms. It may be empty now if you ate them. And I'd like you to exchange them with somebody around you. Do not evaluate who you're exchanging with based on how many M&Ms they have. <laughs> First Corinthians 12. This is a very, very long section. We're reading an entire chapter. So dig in. I'm going to ask you to read a couple different parts here as we get into it. First Corinthians 12, 1 through 31. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, unbelievers, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is the Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Can we just say Jesus is the Lord this morning? Jesus is the Lord. He is. He's the Lord of my life. I hope he is Lord of your life. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for what? The common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of that same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now would you read verse 12 with me? Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. You understand what he's saying? Okay. Now, if a foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, picture that, odd, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. <coughs> and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be what? No division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Let's pause for a second. God's desire for the parts of the body, and if you don't know what he's talking, just fight the church, that the parts would have equal concern for each other. And would you read verse 26 with me? It starts with this. If one part suffers, Every part suffers with it. One part is honored. Every part rejoices with it. 
Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part. I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to ask you to say that to your neighbor. You're going to say, now you are the body of Christ. You are a part of it. Ready? Let's go. You are the body of Christ, and you are an important part of it. Verse 28 says, And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of all different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. All right, we got to 1 Corinthians. You did well. 1 Corinthians, the common source of 1 Corinthians, spiritual gifts are given how? By the Holy Spirit. And you say, that's kind of the same thing we just heard. Well, we want to make sure that we understand what the Bible is saying very clearly. Even though it says that in multiple sections. What does it mean? These are not natural talents. This is not personality strengths. Rather, they are given supernaturally. Our beloved brother Mike isn't here this morning with us. But he is awful good at harmonica and guitar. Would you agree? Yes. We talked about him. He, he, can't, he can't be boastful this morning because he's not here. But that's not a spiritual gift, per se. That's a natural talent. How he does it may be something that the Spirit enables him to do. We want to make sure we understand that when the Bible talks about spiritual gifts, it's not talking about your natural abilities. It's talking about something that God takes and places in you, and then it works out of you. I never, ever wanted to be the person talking. I did not take speech in high school. I ran from it and found any other class I could because it, it just petrified me to stand in front of a group of kids and talk. And I don't know if you know, but on occasion, I speak in front of people now. <laughs> the first time that I ever spoke in front of people and felt completely comfortable with no fear was when I gave my testimony at the church in high school. They asked me to do that. There's a church about this size. And asked me to speak, I said, okay. And I got up and spoke, and afterwards, yeah, God worked through it. Common purpose of spiritual gifts in Romans 12, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, is one body with many functions, and it goes to great lengths to explain this one body. We're not all the ear, we're not all the eye, we're not all the mouth. You know, there's, there's not that. Is there a part of your body that you would gladly sacrifice this morning and say, I'm just tired of that? <laughs> well, I mean, you need it. Even your little baby toe, you need that thing. Helps you balance. One body, many functions, different kinds, but same kingdom. The gifts come in many different ways, but it's all towards the same main function, main focus. The meaning of this is the gifts that the Spirit gives, the gifts that the Spirit gives vary, but the purpose remains continuing the ministry of Jesus. And I hope you're hearing that. And I hope as you hear that, you're hearing that God is telling you that you have a role in continuing the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth today. Because that is what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Would you read verse 7 with me? But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip, let's read this part together, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ means everything Jesus is wanting to do is being done in us and through us. 
And so God is gifting all these things so that they can all come together and work together in unity so that everything that God wants to happen can happen in this world. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves. When? When the body of Christ works together in unity to do the ministry God has for us. When that happens, then on individual level, we're not going to be tossed around anymore by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will be, grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting <coughs> ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. All right, you still with me? All right, please trade your bag that you have. It cannot go back to your original bag. It has to go to a new person. The common source that we see in Ephesians chapter 4 is that Christ himself, by the Holy Spirit, gave and gives gifts and calls. We see that some in Corinthians as well, the calling part, not just the gift, but there are calls as well. A calling is when someone is not just given a gift, but they are called to a specific position within the body to do specific tasks. And that's, that's as elaborate as we're going to get on calling. So the gifts and calls, what this means is gifts and calling are a part of the very plans of Jesus that he initiated, the very plans that Jesus initiated, and the plans that Jesus is still doing to this day. We sing that song this morning, you are here, moving in our midst, working in our midst, touching every heart, mending every heart. Jesus is doing that today through his church, through the believers, and that is you. That is what he initiated with the disciples, and that is what he continues to do today. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are not exempt from any of this. It all applies to you. So what we see then in the spiritual gifts is this. We see that uh, Romans has these gifts listed. It has prophecy, faith, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, and mercy are the gifts that are listed in Romans. You don't have to write these down. These are things you can read in those passages. We see in Corinthians, it says wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, Miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, which also could be called discernment, speaking or interpreting tongues. We see in Ephesians it lists positions, calls rather than specific gifts, the call of the apostle, the call of the prophet, the call of the evangelist, pastors, and teachers. And so as we look at these different things, we come to understand the gifts work to fulfill three main purposes in the church. You look at all these gifts and you can narrow them down to three main purposes that the Holy Spirit is working to build within his church. Are you ready for them? God wants to bring in his church through gifts that he is giving to each of us, maturity. Maturity in our faith. He wants us to grow up in our faith. Unity within the church. The Bible talks about unity of the church as much as anything in the New Testament. When Jesus prayed for us, which he prayed for us in John chapter 17, his prayer was that we would be one. Not just Melba French Church, but that all Christians would be one. Now, how would you say we as a church in America are doing at being one? It would be a lot better, right? How do you think God wants that to be healed? Through you. Through the gifts that he is giving each of you. The gifts that he's giving to you to bring about unity within the church body, not just the local church body, but, but within the broader church body as well. There have been times, friend, in this church where we've experienced small little breaks of division. And because we didn't have the church body working together with everybody working in unity, working in, in their spiritual gifts, things happened that shouldn't have happened. And we lost people. And that shouldn't happen in any body of believers. But it happens all the time because we lack the unity. Because we lack using the gifts effectively. And the third thing that the Holy Spirit works to do is to bring about efficiency in the church. The church's main ministry is to continue everything that Jesus was doing. Jesus not just brought healing and brought his disciples teaching, but he also went and was storming the gates of hell. And the church is supposed to do the same thing. 
And we're not supposed to do that haphazardly. We're supposed to do that with wisdom and understanding. We're supposed to take every uh, enemy, every lie, take it captive and make it obedient to Christ. And that is done with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And in evangelism, that needs to be done not just haphazardly. You can wound people trying to evangelize to them when what you're really trying to do is to teach them about the goodness of God. And so the church works together. And as each person does its part, the church becomes more and more mature, becomes more and more united, and becomes more and more effective. We use the terms grow, bless, go. That is the, the aspects of the church. We're to come together and grow, to bless, and to go into this world. And as we do those things together, and each of us does our part, it becomes more effective. Now, I didn't get a bag of M&Ms this morning. I, I think some of you think, and this is a flaw in the United States, I think a lot of you think in the United States that the pastor has a bag that looks like this. <laughs> and that you guys are supposed to come with empty little bags and get all these poured out. Is that, is that accurate? It's, it's, it's critical of the church. Greg, accurate? No. It's accurate what's happening, but it's not what God wants. I'm one person. I have the gifts that God has given me and only those gifts. I do not, there's not a, there's one person that had all the gifts of the Spirit. His name started with a J and ended with Jesus. It was Jesus. He had all the gifts. Nobody since then has. These are the gifts. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're growing in your faith, then these, then something the Holy Spirit is doing is going to bring something along these lines into your life so that it can come out of your life to help the church become more mature, more united, or more effective. Right? That's what we just read, it says. And I don't think the Bible lies. So what do we do with that? We need to understand some things as we look into this a little bit more. So let's go back and say this again. Your personality and natural talents are not the same thing as a spiritual gift. I just want to say that again because sometimes that gets convoluted. You may just be naturally good um, at some things. That's not the same thing. I am naturally a really good cricket. I don't know. I was going to make up something. Yeah. There, there are some things that I'm okay at personally, that, and there's a lot that I'm not good at. Spiritual gift is different than that. Spiritual gifts are given. And what that means is that they're given by the Holy Spirit, and that means they are entrusted to us. If you understand what it means to entrust someone with something, if you're a parent, you would know that sometimes you entrust your kids with things, and if they don't use them responsibly, what would you do? You might restrict their use of those things, correct? I believe that the Holy Spirit can do the same thing in our lives today. If we don't use them, uh, yeah, he may remove them. This person said, I think your spiritual gift will bring you joy. This person served in ministry for, for many years and then left that ministry in order to serve in a regular work position in the capacity of somebody who loves Jesus. And he says, I feel like I, I am doing more for the kingdom now in a secular job than I ever did as, as a youth pastor. He says, I think your spiritual gift will bring you joy. It will be obvious when God is using you. It may not always be comfortable. I love that line. But it will feel like it's a big part of who you are. How do we know what our spiritual gift is? That's a question that's probably on the tip of your tongue. You may be wanting to know, okay, I believe this, but what's my spiritual gift? I'm not going to give you easy answers this morning. Because the reality is, is there's an uncommon experience when it comes to spiritual gifts. While the purposes and the source of the gifts are the same, the experience each believer has with their gifts seems to vary. And this is true across church boards. It's true across churches that I've been a part of, true across Christians I've been. Even the person who said, I don't really know what my spiritual gift is if I had to say it right now. It's not that they're not effective in ministry. They just don't know how it is they're effective in ministry. The experience is different. And with everybody I've talked to, there wasn't one common thing other than that, yeah, it's just, it's just there. And you kind of become known, it becomes known to you in time. Other things we need to know about spiritual gifts, it is possible to have more than one gift. It is also possible that you would receive a spiritual gift when it is needed and not beforehand. I often think, and this is Chris speaking, not the Bible, I often think that we don't know what our spiritual gifts are until we step out in faith and do what God is telling us to do. When we step out in faith, obeying the, the Holy Spirit, that is when he gives us what we need to be effective, and he doesn't usually give us that before. 
Some people find their gift by working through what's called an inventory or evaluation. It's kind of like a little test that you take. It's, it, you take out and you answer all these questions and it narrows down what your spiritual gift may be based on who you are and what you do on a normal basis. I don't always buy into that, I don't love that, but it can be effective, it can be good for some. For me, I, I, I struggle with that for my own personal reasons. Not that it's not biblical, not that it's not good, but for some people that's really helpful. Some people find out in miraculous ways. And some people, they simply cannot point to their gifts, though others might say, well, it's obvious that your gift is such and such. Which is part of the church being a community. The gifts of the Spirit work to fulfill three main purposes. Do you remember what they are? I want to say it again. Because this is what God may be doing in your life. And I wonder this morning if God points to one of these and the Spirit nudges you towards one of these more than others. That the church would grow in maturity. We'd be stronger in our faith. We'd be stronger in knowing Jesus. Stronger in understanding what the devil's trying to do to dissuade and destroy us. Be stronger parents as, as followers of Christ that we would mature. That our youth would know Jesus. Is that something that God is putting on your heart? That, that we'd be more united. That when people are struggling, that they would know they're loved and that we would carry each other through difficult times so that we could carry on more effectively as a body. Maybe more efficient. Maybe you see things that are going on and you say, oh, if only the church could step up in these areas, how much we could change the world or change Melbourne. Maybe the Holy Spirit is nudging you one way or another this morning. Maybe not. Maybe, and most likely, you need to take these home and pray. But before we get done here this morning, we have a couple other quotes, and we have one other huge, massive point. One big, 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 big point that we cannot miss when we talk about spiritual gifts, because it's, it's, it's essential. Each time, each and every time the spiritual gifts are mentioned in the Bible, they're immediately followed by the same main subject, every single time. I'm going to read the passages. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Romans 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. If you know your Bible and you know 1 Corinthians 12, then you might know what 1 Corinthians 13 says. I'm going to guess that it might have been read at your wedding. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Did you read it with me? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I fully know. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Love is the point. Spiritual gifts exist for the purpose and point of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have 
everlasting life. Jesus gives gifts to his church so that in love they would serve and bless one another and others. God gives gifts to us so we would love him as best as we can. This person said, the gift is secondary to the giver of the gift. I love that line. The gift that we're given is secondary to the giver of the gift and also secondary to the people we're hoping to bless using these gifts. Why? Because we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. Love is the point. How would it change the world, friends, if the church continually grew in maturity, in unity, and in efficiency? We would make the news, but in totally different ways than what we might see today. Oh, that we would. Oh, that we would. You were saved for eternal purposes. I was saved for eternal purposes. You're not saved for temporary purposes. God's not done with you. He's not done with your family, with your kids. He is continuing to work in you. Love God with all that you are. Love his people, the lost ones and those that are found. Those are the ones standing next to you. And obey the Lord's leading to serve. If you listen, he will tell you what to do. He will push you. He will nudge you. Obey. And you will find him working through you. A couple other quotes as we close. This person said, so well, read the passages. Maybe take some assessments. But ask people who what? Who love you and know you about what they see in you. Love is the point. Would you exchange your bags one more time? Can't be a person that you've exchanged with already. You just have a couple of moments left. You can do this, friends. And what you may do with this final bag is you may open it if you would like and eat. Eat the M&Ms that have been from somebody else. I am astonished that nobody came up here. I'm still astonished. I am unbelievably astonished. A little child will lead them. <laughs> I think his parents, what a perfect cue, Maggie, thank you so much. And I think his parents recognizing everything we just talked about goes for our children too is important. Parents, God wants to do the same things through your kids as they will stand before the Lord on their own. Amen. That should change your prayer life, shouldn't it? So what do we conclude with? Love. Follow the Lord, love the Lord, follow the Lord, love his church, follow along with his plan for the church. And guess what? You'll find out what his spiritual gift is for you. There isn't this basic formula other than to love and follow. Jesus said it to his disciples like this, and if you've been following along in the, uh, what is the Bible series uh, on video called? That we were, the Chosen, yeah, come and see. I think Jesus says that to us all the time. Come find me, come and see. You want to know what your spiritual gift is? Follow Jesus and find out. Essentials. There are two kingdoms, friend. They are at war. The lives of many are at stake. We talked about that last week. The enemy is still at work to divide, to distract, and discourage. But God is at work to equip his church to win battle after battle as we work together to serve the advancing of his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Let us look at this prayer that we can pray to close us. Abba, Father, I sit in awe of your plans today. Your plans for your kingdom, for your church, and for me. They are vast and they are wonderful. Thank you for inviting me to be part of such an important mission. Joining your church and your spirit to bring life, to bring light, and to bring your love to a hurting and broken world. I want to bring to you any uncertainty I have this morning about my worth, about my role, or about your spirit's ability to work in and through me. Can we just do that now? Maybe this morning you're saying, yes, but man, I'm struggling in this area of my life. Or maybe this isn't going well for you. Maybe work, maybe something in life isn't going well, and you're thinking, yeah, maybe if I get this fixed, I'll then be able to do what God asks. No. 
Let's lay those uncertainties at the foot of the cross. Let's love Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Let I bring this uncertainty to you I have about my worth, my role, and your spirit's ability to work in and through me. I want to use. Would you pray this with me? I want to use whatever gift you might place in me to bless others. Help me to be willing to minister, but also to be willing to receive ministry of others. You are love, Father, and in love, I ask that your kingdom come, your will be done, here on earth, here in Melba, today as it is in heaven. 